life is simple for animals. So when we are in their presence, a little of that simplicity rubs off on us and we can unkink ourselves. Hi, my name is Anita Novak and I'm the author of this book. Welcome to season 12 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by Rona Maynard, who found happiness at 65, a story she tells in her new memoir, her fabulous new memoir, Starter Dog, My Path to Joy, Belonging, and Loving in This World. Rona first broke into print at the age of 14 with a short story about bullying and still receives fan mail from teens who are reading it in class. We will talk about this. Rona capped a stellar career in magazines with a decade at the helm of Chatelaine, Canada's leading magazine for women. Her editor's column garnered a loyal following, and when she disclosed a struggle with depression, she helped kickstart a national conversation about mental health. After Chatelaine... Rona had to learn to unwind and found that her best teacher was a rescue mutt who had received his basic training in a prison. Welcome to the show, Rona. I'm delighted to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. And I want to actually rewind back to you at 14 years old. Before we got on this call, I actually read your short story, and which is called The Fan Club. And I want to ask the question about why you suppose it still resonates with so many young teenagers today and what that says about empathy. It's a story about bullying. And this is a pressure that does not go away. Young people tend to know what the right thing is. Their impulse, uh, unless they've truly got something wrong with them, is to be kind, to want others to be happy, to want to help, although they frequently do not know how. And they're also lacking in courage because they're so conscious of peer pressure, that desire to fit in and measure up. The story was inspired by a real event in my ninth grade classroom where the entire class ganged up against a very shy, not terribly competent student who was giving an oral report. They rose from their seats as his fan club and they held up signs. And you could just see the color drain out of this boy's face as he realized they were mocking him. And I did not stand up, but I did not defend him either. And the teacher did not defend him. The teacher did nothing. I was very troubled by the incident and used it as the basis of a story in which the stand-in for me actually does get up and clap. She betrays her deepest principles. Well, we're going to include a link in the show notes uh, so people can read it. There's also a set of questions that I came across that teachers and parents use with their teenagers to have a conversation. Anyways, I want to thank you for writing that. And you've continued to be a writer your whole life and what a writer you are. Um, let's, could I invite you because I, from the get go in the opening page of your book, you have an author's note and uh, I'd love for you to read it. So our listeners and, and viewers can kind of get a first sample about this book and be left on a cliffhanger and go out and buy it. I would be honored. You know what they say about dog books. The dog always dies in the end. Not this book. You can relax. When my senior dog leaps at squirrels like a puppy, I can almost believe he'll live forever. 
I'm a senior human old enough to know better. Every story I tell, including this one, is to some degree about time and what it carries off. People I loved or used to be, animals who found the sunniest corners of places I called home. Every beginning holds the seed of an ending. But first, there will be marvels. The great astonishment that sweeps away the same old, same old. First, there will be fun. A year offers 525,600 minutes. You want more. It's only human. And yet a minute fully lived can feel like all the time in the world. Let's take a walk with a very good boy. He can't wait to get started. Oh. Okay, I love that. Why did you write this book? Who's it for? What do you want readers to get from it? The first thing I'd love for them to get from it is that you're never too old. You're never too set in your ways to discover a new way of being in the world. And the way you do that is you try something new. Uh, I had been um, very hidebound. I was caught up in this way of life that is all about working and achieving and uh, delivering your deliverables and meeting your metrics. And after I lost, um, oh, pardon me, I didn't lose it. I left my, my big job at Chatelaine. I didn't have to measure up to anything. So how did I know uh, whether I was doing a good job? Who was I? Who was I going to be? I could be a different person. But first, I had to get a dog. <laughs> And it, so the, the book is really for people who feel stuck, who are looking for more, but it's a very agreeable book that will meet you where you are. And if you are simply a dog lover, it will take you back to those first moments when you fell delightfully in love with your dog. But you don't have to love dogs in order to relate to this book. I've been told that by reader after reader. Mm -hmm. um, so the book was published not too long ago. Is there a postscript that you would add now? Well, I would love it if people would um, consider adopting a dog at 65 or later, mm -hmm. because I have heard of far too many people who think that dogs are only for uh, families with young kids or folks who can go out running with their dog, you know, super active people. And this is just not the case. I used to believe all that stuff myself. Well, I love the fact that it was your husband that gave you the nudge and that you kind of came around to where it's like, how often does my husband give me bad advice or make a bad suggestion? Almost never. And uh, I mean, he can take a little bit of credit. No. Oh, he can, he, he can really take a lot of credit. And the other thing I need to emphasize is that I've been married a long time, uh, more than 50 years. And I have learned a thing or two about keeping a marriage alive. And one of the most important things is if somebody has a dream, if one of you has a dream that's very important, if one of you is just yearning for something and that desire is very strong, don't trample it. Mm. See if you can meet your partner mm. and give it a go. Now, if I had said, there's no way I'm having a dog in the house, and in the book, I explain what all those reasons are, why really. one couldn't possibly have a dog. He would have forgiven me. He wouldn't have held it against me, but there would have been this little nagging regret. Mm -hmm. And I have this concept of the someday file. The someday file is that mental box in which 
we put all those things that we're kind of sort of hoping to make our own someday. Mm -hmm. And it could have been uh, working in another country. Well, that was that was a dream we put in the someday file and we never did it, became too late. We filed another child under someday, it became too late. Uh, there were a bunch of things in the someday file and I thought the dog was probably someday, mm -hmm. but we took it out of someday. Mm -hmm. And you feel younger and more full of possibility right away if you act on something now mm -hmm. that you have filed under someday. Someday that becomes today. Why not? Why not? Yes. <laughs> now, you have mentioned just before that you were ambitious and hardworking. And um, I just want to ask what you think about how working life with this focus on achievement actually impacts our capacity for kindness, just at a high level. I think it has a negative impact, very negative, because... Even if you are the kind of workplace leader who believes in building a strong team and mentoring people, and I definitely was that kind, it is all about putting results on the line. And you stand and fall by what you actually accomplished today. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing to do is nothing. The hardest thing to do is just be fully present in the world and respond to whatever and whoever comes along mm -hmm. and really attend to that person. Um, when I was working, and for a long time afterwards, I would jar charge right past people on the street. Mm -hmm. I would just look right through them. And it was because I had to get to the office and get things done. And unless you were standing in my door or sending me an email, uh, or demanding that something be done right away, I didn't notice. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that working life blunts our capacity to see and hear one another because there isn't going to be any tangible result mm -hmm. from most of these interactions and conversations. It's not going to put anything on the bottom line. Gosh, you just brought up a really big memory for me. This is like 20 plus years ago. I was getting over a very big breakup and I wanted to go away on a vacation and it was on a whim that nobody could go. And I was like, I'll go by myself. So I spent a week, I don't even remember where it was, somewhere in the Caribbean, I think maybe the Dominican. And I was on a beach and there was a photo shoot, probably for a magazine, like with, you know, the, the reflectors and the oh, yes. Yes. model and the the paper. Yes. All of that. And I was watching the shoot and I was thinking to myself, I was like, I'm never going to be younger than I am today. Um, I'm going to be really bold and I'm going to go over to the photographer and I'm going to ask whether or not he could take a two minutes of shots of me and send them to me. And it was a German photographer, and I speak a bit of German. And he said, "Wir haben zu viel zu tun," which which translates to, "I'm sorry, we're too busy. We have too much to do." And so he didn't do it, and I regret that so much. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised at all because I they're they're under a lot of pressure and they're proud and it's hot and they're worried they're worried about the makeup running yeah. and yeah all those tiny little things that happen uh on a photo shoot 
Yeah. I mean, I certainly don't on a day, like on a practical level, don't uh, harbor any ill feelings, but I think it just speaks to we're all rushing and we don't slow down enough to make eye contact and just to let people be seen. Um, so I really appreciated uh, that comment and, 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 and yeah, that really aroused a memory for me. Um, <laughs> now, what about animals? What is it about them? And in your case, your dog that unlocks empathy in us mere mortals. An animal comes into your home and it's a small, nonverbal, tender creature that needs care. Mm. And whether it's a cat, a rabbit, a dog, or a hamster, that animal's life is in your hands. And your only goal for this creature, in my case, a dog, is to give it a good life. Mm -hmm. Casey came in and I just wanted him to be happy. And I just wanted him to have a good day and another good day after that. He is very sensitive to how we are feeling as I think most dogs are, and some people will tell you that cats are. Mm -hmm. There's a whole way of relating to an animal that is without words, and it is all through your senses. You can put your hand uh, on your dog's belly as he sleeps, and your hand will go gently up and down and you will feel the beauty of an animal's regular breath. Mm -hmm. You can also do this with your cat and you'll get purring too. And it's very calming. Life is simple for animals. So when we are in their presence, a little of that simplicity rubs off on us and we can unkink ourselves beautiful um i'm going to invite anybody watching on youtube right now who uh, has the experience of um interfacing it connecting with a pet at home uh to share in a comment something that happened to them that uh might lift our spirits to read so feel free to oh, add those comments that um, would be fun and some people get this going with a horse as well Oh yeah, I had equine coaching uh, for the first time last fall and it was revolutionary to me. I had no idea how empathic horses were. I mean, it was really transformational. So yeah. Um, and cats too. I grew up with a cat, even though I was allergic to a cat. My parents brought a cat into the house and then the cat had a litter of four kittens. We, My mom took us out from school to watch the birth. She thought it was so important. And our cat was super independent as like a lot of cats are, but um, would undoubtedly find us when we were having a cry fest. And as teenage daughters in the house, there were many of those. Hey there, I don't mean to interrupt a fabulous conversation. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there are so many other great conversations on my YouTube channel. Over 120 episodes with already 25,000 views completely organic thanks to you my listeners viewers watchers please subscribe the world needs more empathy and you have a role to play I, i'm curious to get your feedback on something um i interviewed a researcher in the uk that studies touch and has just written a book about touch and and um was the lead researcher on a global touch survey and you know spoke on the podcast about all of the physical and psychological and spiritual benefits that we get from just like touching each other. And, and it can be like non-sexual touch, all sorts of touch really matters to our health and well-being. And I asked him about technology and he was saying that even robot dogs, if you pet them, provides um, a benefit to us. <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, I, my first reaction was surprise. And then I remembered I'd seen something like that on YouTube. They, these dogs, these robot dogs go into old age homes. Mm. And I think it is probably because they trigger primal memories. Mm. We all have a memory of touching an animal. Mm. 
And the robot dog can awaken that. And I'm sure it, it wags its tail. And then we think of all the uh, dogs that we've known in our life uh, wagging their tail. So yes, yes, it, it, it does make sense. I should tell you, by the way, that with humans, I'm not very touchy. Mm -hmm. I have not been a hugger for most of my life. I have learned to hug in the past few years. And I think it's partly because I am living with a dog that I've become a little bit more outgoing and willing to try other ways of relating to people. So you've become a bona fide dog person. I am totally a dog person. Converted. And every dog that I meet who is not Cujo is the second best dog in the world. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Um, switching gears just a little, you've struggled with depression and you turned your life around in therapy. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how that therapy affected your relationship with empathy or your thinking about empathy. Well, I may disappoint you because it didn't. Oh, okay. Uh, the therapy was all about me. Oh. Huh. The therapy was all about me standing up for myself and uh, not letting other people's expectations constrain me. Mm. So, it, and it was a very mental, mentally focused kind of therapy. Mm. Uh, I felt when I was working with my shrink that I was like a bright graduate student. Hmm. And she was challenging me and nudging me and asking me questions because my thesis was not going to make the grade uh, if I didn't uh, straighten out my thinking. It probably is different with some other therapists, but mine was definitely all about kicking my butt until I took control of my own life. So it was really, really self-focused. Uh, like a lot of women, particularly, I had been quite hung up on pleasing people. It didn't look that way uh, to the outside world, but it was a fact. Uh, my mother had very high demands for me. She was alive at that time. And I tended to get caught in a lot of family situations where I was mediating between people who didn't get along. And it was not good for me. Mm. It was, in fact, very bad for me. And I had to stop thinking so much about those people and how I could make their life better. Mm. So it was necessary. It was, it was a corrective. But... It really wasn't until I bought a dog quite late in the game that I started to see myself as a neighbor among neighbors and an animal among animals mm -hmm. because I was meeting so many different creatures, human and not, in the course of an ordinary walk and and uh I found myself trying to be kind. I remember there was one day that the uh path in the park was covered with earthworms. And I started trying to lift the earthworms off the path and into the grass for fear that somebody would step on them. Perhaps because of the rain, they were the most beautiful colors that day. They looked like a Monet painting. But the, the earthworms didn't like being picked up. That was very clear. So uh, it was one of those worthy ideas that didn't work out so well in practice. Hmm. Now, since you mentioned your mom, um, Let's talk for just a second about another memoir that you wrote, which I gave to my own mother 
uh, as a Mother's Day gift last year, not in 2023, but 2022. And she did read it and loved it. Um, I'd love for you to talk for a minute about that book. Um, but <laughs> she asked me afterwards, she's like, did you give that book to me with the intention to send a message? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that book for a moment. Well, that book was about becoming myself because of, and also in spite of, a very strong, brilliant, funny, domineering, excessively loving mother who had the ability to do everything I've done and then some, but because she was a woman born in 1922, she did not have the opportunities that I had. She had uh, a doctorate from Radcliffe. She was the most brilliant student wherever she went. Phi Beta Kappa, uh, top honors all the way. And because she happened to be female and Jewish didn't help either, she could not get a position teaching in a university. Luck was not with her. I remember she was told once that uh, they would not this give her any course to teach that a man might want to teach. Mm -hmm. They said, we can get a man to teach Renaissance literature, but it's really hard to get anyone to teach Anglo-Saxon. So if you go back to school and get your Anglo-Saxon up to snuff, we can give you that. But she didn't want to teach that. No. She became a writer and a very successful one as a default career. Hmm. And I don't think she ever got over the fact that she was passionate about teaching a subject matter expert and she just couldn't get in the door. Hmm. And lesser people were getting jobs because they were men. That really frosted her. So this book, uh, remind me the name of the... Of the called My Mother's Daughter. You're right. Right. We're going to include information about that book in the show notes, along with Starter Dog, um, that explores your relationship with her. Wonderful. I'm very proud of that one, too. So um, do you have any favorite tips for practicing empathy in everyday life? As a, as a dog owner now, uh, or otherwise, uh, given your, your life and lived experiences? Well, the real hardcore empathic dog owners don't use the term dog owner. No, okay. Because it it, it because a dog's a living creature. It's right. not like your refrigerator. It's right. not like your lipstick. So what's the term but, I should use? Uh, well, I call myself his human. Uh, I'm Casey's person. I'm Casey's human. Uh, I do use the term owner sometimes, but dog people... Yeah can get a little bit leery uh, because they are super empathic around dogs. But my number one tip is pay attention. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to slow down. Really look at where you are and who you are with. And if you look at where you are, you will get a lot of clues about the people and the animals who share that space with you. I live in a very urban neighborhood. It's downtown Toronto. And I often walk Casey past some extremely modest row houses. And in the window of one of those houses, was a sign that said, our house is a very, very, very fine house. And this is a line 
from a song that Graham Nash wrote for Joni Mitchell when they had a house together in Laurel Canyon. And maybe their house was beautiful. This was not a beautiful house. It needed some paint. Uh, it looked a little dusty, but from the sign on the door, I could tell this was a loved house. Mm. And these people are full of love. And when they come home to their house, they do not think about uh, the chip paint or the dust. They just think they're home with their family. Mm. Yeah. This is a fine house. So how do we judge where we are? I think we judge where we are and, and who we're with far too quickly. We shouldn't really be judging at all. We should just be knowing. We, we should be perceiving and letting ourselves respond to what we perceive. So knowing everything that you know now about what it means to live with a dog, would you tell your 20 something, 30 something, 40 something, 50 something at any point through your life to go out and do it? Not necessarily, because you've got to be ready for a dog. Mm. I would definitely not say, I would definitely say any time can be right. In fact, when um, Casey leaves us, uh, although we'll probably be in our late 70s, I think we could handle another dog, a little dog. But a person who is very busy and preoccupied and doesn't want to slow down, doesn't want to make any modifications for a dog, is not ready and we see dogs left at shelters because somebody's just tired of looking after them or they're too old. They're not fun mm. anymore. A dog is a relationship mm. that is going to evolve over time. And although I have not been there yet with Casey, I know that when he gets old, it'll be like having a really old human mm. in the house. Mm. If you have an old dog, you're paying for that old dog's medication and you have to be around to care for a, a very fragile creature that you love. Now, when I was much younger, when I was in my 50s and working really hard, I hit on the idea that if we got a dog, I would be able to get out of the office faster and I'd have a reason to get home and I'd have this really beautiful dog to walk. Uh, and I didn't want a dog. I wanted a fashion accessory and an exercise machine. That's what I wanted. But while I was in this phase, Christmas was coming up and my husband told me not to go in the garage. Uh-oh, I thought, who knows I want a dog. There's a dog in the garage for me. I'm getting a dog for Christmas. So for about 10 days, I become possessed by this notion that there's a dog living in the garage. It doesn't even occur to me to ask, why do I not hear barking? Why is a dog being left alone in the garage? When does the dog walk? Who is giving love to that dog? And Christmas morning came and my husband went to the garage to get my present. And it was a neon sign with my name on it <laughs> in the shape of my signature. It was absolutely a wonderful present, but I was a little bit deflated that it wasn't a dog. And yet, honestly, anyone who thinks you can leave a dog in a garage for 10 days <laughs> does not deserve to have a dog. <laughs> love it, love it. 
With our final few minutes, Rona, um, I love ending my conversations with guests on this note. If you can think of a time in your life when you were on the receiving end of empathy, what happened and what did that mean for you? Yes, I was in my first job and I had a wonderful mentor named Keitha McLean, who was an alcoholic in recovery. And she knew that I was very angry at my father for being an alcoholic. She also knew that I was incredibly talented and I did not know what to do with myself. And after hours, she would often invite me into her office to talk about what was on my mind. And I felt so privileged to have her full attention. I loved and revered this woman. And I remember she did once talk to me about my father and I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was something along the lines of, you know, Rona, nobody gets up in the morning and says, I think I'll become an alcoholic. People drink to solve a problem, and then the drinking becomes the problem. And she looked at me with her total unjudging attention and I knew that I didn't get it and that she knew I didn't get it and she was with me anyway I didn't have to get it I didn't I was allowed to be confused I was allowed to be judgmental when I would talk to my mother about uh my anger at my father she would say things like, you'll be sorry when he dies. Mm. And I was not. I was relieved mm. because I didn't want any more calls in the, in the middle of the night. Mm. But the capacity to make someone feel as if they're the most important person in your day mm. is a true gift. And if you can do that in your professional life, the people who work for you will be so devoted and loyal mm -hmm. and inspired. They will crawl over nails on their stomachs to do their very best. It's a great message. And, uh, I love this woman too, that she shared that wisdom, which I'm sure now, um, well, obviously if you're telling the story, you know, stays with you all these many years later. She's in my mother's daughter. Mm. Mm. She died young. She died young. Well, this has been uh, a great pleasure, privilege, honor to share uh, this afternoon with you. Um, I think there are many times throughout the year the holiday season and Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, like birthdays, lots of reasons to pick up a copy of your book, The Starter Dog. So please do. I want to thank everybody for watching and listening. Thank you, Rona. And we'll see you next week at Purposeful Empathy. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much for watching an episode of Purposeful Empathy. If you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe to the channel and also consider picking up your copy of Purposeful Empathy. It's an invitation to dial up empathy in your life. The world needs more empathy. We need more empathy. What are you waiting for?